This program has been brought to you by Cell One, Parleyville Pharmacy, Butterfield and Vallis, and the Friesenbrook Meyer Group. Clothing and accessories provided by Artillery Boutique. Welcome to 2015's 10 Most Fascinating People of Bermuda. I'm Lisa Pickering. Everyone has a story, a little something that makes them unique, especially right here in Bermuda. But what does it mean to be fascinating? We've put together a list of 10 Bermudians that captured the headlines in 2015. Whether they've been the subject of controversy or of great praise, there isn't an individual on this list that hasn't come up in conversation around the dinner table, at the office, or at social gatherings. Each individual featured on this list share one thing in common. They all have shown passion, determination, and perseverance in the face of setbacks. The list is in no particular order, but the final subject revealed is this year's most fascinating person of Bermuda. Let's get started. He's been a lion tracker in Botswana, a orangutan keeper, and a tiger shark tracker, but these exciting jobs form only a small part of Choi and Ming's resume. From a young age, Choi's passion for wildlife and love of the ocean has led him to become an expert on the waters surrounding Bermuda, and a key player in telling the stories of Bermuda's marine environment. His close friendship and shared love of the ocean with the late beloved vet, Dr. Neil Burney, grew into a filming adventure which would later become the TV series Ocean Vet. Their findings on the Tiger Shark Project have proved to be significant to scientists, suggesting that these sharks make frequent journeys between the warm waters of the Caribbean and the North Atlantic Ocean. But for Choi, his journey all started with whales. Just seeing the whales got me sort of re-inspired here and thinking, this is amazing, you know, we're not, we're really not sort of utilizing this resource, enjoying this, showing people, showing off our island, you know, we, we have all these amazing things. So I started with that. I'm a, I'm a fairly excitable person, not nearly as much as, as Neil Burney, <laughs> but you know, we, we had a good rapport. I showed him the whales and then he got me out to the sharks and it, it all really kicked off from there. So yeah. that is the beginning of, I guess, the Bermuda Shark, Shark Project, Project. Which, yeah, exactly. Um, it came into fruition in 20, 2005. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's when we, we, 2005, we first got together. I started getting very interested in the sharks after the first day we went out. Four sharks came up to the boat. I'd never seen a shark in seven, eight years and 2,000 dives in Bermuda inside the reef. And they were just banging around and, you know, I had the camera and it's, it's funny because if you look back at the footage now, it was so exciting. But now that we're kind of uh, working a bit more, I guess, as, you know, professional cameramen, you look back at the footage and you just laugh at how atrocious it was. But at the same time, it was just, I just remember the excitement and I can hear, you know, us yelling through our snorkels. And I just said, I think this is the start of something big. And, you know, he, he definitely agreed. So then in 2008, you started tagging the sharks. Yeah. yeah. How we had crazy. some local support and because the satellite tagging is quite expensive. Uh, you're looking at about six or seven thousand dollars by the time you buy the tag, uh, pay for the satellite time, get someone to break it down, the, like the whole process. Well, it's funny, we went around to a few of the local construction companies and we thought, um, you know, it's better than like a football pool or something like that. We had like little competitions among them, like whose shark could go the farthest, who would get the biggest shark, you know, just, just various things like that. And uh, it, was a, it was a good way to sell it and, and get people excited about conservation because it was all uh, interesting real-time data that had never been um, uh, used, uh, never been uh, measured before. So that was really, really exciting. And that's led you to be featured in a, a journal this year, the Nature Journal, yeah. which uh, obviously international press has picked up yeah. um, the research and the data that you've collected. Does it blow your mind at all how much of your data has been used and how useful it is from where this project started to where you are now 10 years later? It's pretty amazing sitting down in these circles with these you know, well-known shark scientists and they're asking you for advice. It's, it's pretty cool how, you know, how that kicked off from just an excitement of, of seeing these animals. Honestly, most people are not going to get to jump in a boat and come out with us and see these things. But at least if we can film them and tell the shark's story, then we can get people to care. And that's a great segue into Ocean Vet. Yeah. Uh, local response, I know that you've been screening portions of the show at um, Bowie. What has the response been from the community who is surrounded by the ocean? Since we started filming Ocean Vet, we've had uh, 11 lectures 
and the first 10 were completely sold out. Well, the first one we did sold out in two hours. In 2016, we're actually launching the series. So the next thing we'll be doing is actually showing the episodes, the full episodes to people. And the really, uh, the, I guess the other exciting thing about Ocean Vet is we've got 10 animal episodes and the 11th episode is a making, uh, like a behind the scenes making of type of episode. And now with Neil's unfortunate passing, we've made that as a bit of a tribute to Neil now as well in the 11th episode. So it is a little behind the scenes and it kind of leads into, um, you know, what happens with Neil. But you're trying to angle as well that uh, sharks aren't the predators that they have once been perceived as. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they're, they're not at all. And, and I think a lot of that honestly comes to from between fishing encounters and what you used to see on TV. Uh, when you're filming sharks, as you know, we, we clearly know now for a television show, you're out there for days or you know, weeks at a time and you're looking for the most exciting action. And a lot of times, you know, you'll be out with a shark for, I don't know, say, say you go out for five days, you might get one hour of really wild, crazy action of the animal. But that's what, get broad, that's what gets broadcast on TV. Whereas most of the shark's day is just cruising around in the blue water, you know, minding its own business, um, looking for food. We give them a healthy respect. It's an 800 pound predator with teeth. I'm never gonna get complacent. But at the same time, I used to work with lions in Botswana. I will take my chances with a shark over a lion any day of the week. <laughs> You're a team of seven, and yeah. you want to continue in the legacy of Neil with Ocean Vet, mm -hmm. season two, uh, hopefully. Yes. What are we looking at for season two? We do have a plan, and we've contacted people, and we are going to do a very similar thing, but we're taking a different approach, because obviously we, we don't have Neil now. Right. Um, so we're going to have to uh, make a few modifications, and I can't talk too, too much about it, but we're uh, basically, like I said, getting another angle. So what is the one takeaway you'd want people to, to take from your work? Um, I think we just want to really inspire people about nature and, and show them everything there is before it's gone because the, the statistics are absolutely alarming. Even if you go with the more conservative estimates, it's still incredibly alarming. At least 50 million sharks are taken out of the ocean every year. Some estimates put it as much as 100. I turned 40 this year, and in my lifetime, we've lost half of the uh, half of the wildlife on planet Earth since I was born. That's so crazy. It's staggering. And, yeah, it's staggering. And what's going to happen too is. As populations dwindle, they're just going to become more susceptible to things. Uh, they're going to have a harder time bouncing back. I mean, it's it's the environment is really in a state of chaos. And what I want is, you know, to, to have a kid that's in school, 10 years old now, to be able to go out in the ocean in 20 years and see a shark, even if it just swims by. I mean, you know, what would planet Earth be like if we didn't have any wild creatures? It'd be just not nearly as amazing. Our next fascinating person of 2015 made headlines when he led the Bermuda Public Services Union march to cabinet grounds over the controversial issue of furlough days and for the subsequent legal action by the Minister of Finance. 33-year-old BPSU President Jason Hayward may describe himself as average and may have been little known before becoming the union's first full-time elected president. However, he made his voice heard in 2015. We wanted to find out more about this accomplished white-collar union leader. No, no real background in, in the union in terms of family history. What I will say is, um, early in my work career, I was elected as shop steward on my department. And naturally, if I take on a role, I take it on to best my ability. So I'm like the super shop steward now. <laughs> and I ensure that I learn all the policies, procedures, and I, I like to challenge management. So. Um, I had no problem representing persons, but that runs back from even, I would say, high school, where um, there were persons who used to pick on people which we consider bullies, and I used to um, try to straighten up the bullies for picking on people. And I was a prefect in school for two weeks, mind you, <laughs> but when I was a prefect, I was a super prefect, and I tried to break up every fight, and I tried to send everybody to class as the whole monitor or whatever it may be. And that's, I think that's just in me. Um, standing up and helping people and I think it just the union provide a platform for me to do that and I think as a result I emerged in that because I just enjoy standing up and protecting people and fighting for people's rights.
You were coined the next generation or generation next of the labor movement here in Bermuda. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I don't know about generation next. Um, I prefer generation now. I think um, every time in history, um, there are persons and they have their place in the time. They have persons that have came before me and I'm just carrying on the baton from those that came before me. What are your defining moments or have you had any defining moments that the seniors have backed you up on? Uh, a huge dispute we had with the government, a further day dispute. Um, at that point in time, persons were wondering what would be the outcome and we came through, there was no further days on the table. And after that, you find that you get respect from your membership because they say you're willing to do what it takes to get the results that are necessary. Now that was a three-day action against government. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that experience? What did you take away? Communication. I think once communication broke down, the um, dispute ran on longer. Had communication with the government not broke down early in, in the first day, then it would never have been a three-day dispute. And I believe that issues are, are sorted out at the table. They're not sorted out through any industrial disputes. As a result, I prefer to sit around the table and come to a resolve rather than having to flex muscle in order to force persons around the table to get a resolve. Obviously, there's been legal action due to statements that you said on CBM about the finance minister and the airport contract. Uh, originally, when the, file, when the suit was filed, it was said it wasn't to threaten your democratic freedom, but to hold you accountable for the words that you spoke. Do you still stand behind those words? I think sometimes I say, if I could do it again, would I have used different words? And I think I've came to the conclusion over and over that no, I wouldn't have used different words. Um, the words I used wasn't to bring down the Minister of Finance. It wasn't to bring shame on the government. It was to talk about issues surrounding an airport project. And um, that, was, that was the intent. If persons got personally offended by it, then um, so be it. But my words were never directed directly at the Minister of Finance. And um, I find it harsh, you know, because I read the Royal Gazette and I see words directly attributed to me, negative words and, and all sorts of words categorizing me. And I never once in my mind say, I'm going to go out and sue that person. But um, what they said, this comes with the territory, so I'll take it in stride. How do you mend the bridge between you and Minister Richards? I don't think you have to mend the bridge in a, in a professional relationship. Um, person say, what if you apologize? Um, or what if he dropped the suit? You know, it's, it's those type of things. Yeah, um, it's fair. But I believe that when required, um, I'm very professional, I'm very tolerant, and I can work alongside anybody. Um, for the betterment of the country. I wouldn't allow any personal dispute to get between um, what's in the best interest of this country. Now you touched on the fact that uh, you have been called malicious, um, radical is something mm -hmm. else that has often been associated with your name. What do you say to individuals that say that you have a radical approach? Radical, I mean, as being a labor leader, radical is um, something um, that you take in stride. It's not too negative, but radical when we need to be. But the majority of the time, they don't see me in meetings day to day, um, working at a table with employers and employees and negotiating and solving grievances and um, putting solutions on the tables to whatever problems may arise. That's the majority of our work. And I believe if you speak to a number of employers that I um, have relations with or HR teams, they will say that, um, um, you know, I'm very competent in what I do, um, I'm very professional, and they don't see that type of emotion that you see um, portrayed in the media when there's a large dispute at the table. And how do you handle those criticisms? Because I'm sure you get criticized quite a, quite a bit in the media, much like any mm -hmm. public figure. A huge support base. Um, persons are always encouraging me. If I go grocery shopping, there are persons in the aisle trying to stop me to have a conversation. Um, when you look at your membership and have a membership meeting, when you look at those eyes glazing back at you, you know that those persons have hope and belief in you. So um, I know when I stop doing what I do, I'm failing a lot of people. Now it has been said the recession's coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic for 2016 in terms of employment rates? I think the economy has stabilized. Um, I haven't seen that translate into job growth. That's still alarming. The problem that we had with our jobs is again the mismatch and I haven't seen much done to turn that corner in reference to the mismatch. 
I would have thought that the national training plan would have been a tool to assist, but that hasn't um, came to fruition. But what we need to do is we need to have concentrated education programs to educate persons in job areas that are required in the economy. You're the first elected full-time president of the BPSU. Correct. Did you ever have aspirations to head up the union? I, I did. Um, when you go into Union Hall, you see pictures of 40 past presidents and, and attending union meetings. I would look at those pictures and say, I want my picture up on the wall. It was a, a goal of mine to become the president and um, probably one of my most fulfilling moments. You come from a long line of presidents, obviously, with uh, legacies behind them. Mm -hmm. What would you want to see your legacy be like? All I want to see is if, if, if there's a picture on the wall, um, under that picture should be fight or worry or something like that. That's what I am. From catwalks to Pharrell's red carpet Bermuda tuxedo, the iconic Bermuda shorts is making a comeback. And riding on this wave of renewed fashion relevance is Rebecca Hansen, founder of Tabs, the authentic Bermuda shorts. In only two and a half years, Rebecca has taken her bright and bold variety of her quirky business uniform to local and international success, where the demand continues to grow. The shorts have even graced the pages of some of the top magazines in the world. Now Rebecca is expanding her brand and shorts are just the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a, I was moving back to Bermuda and I didn't have a job at the time, so I was trying to think what I could do with my skill set to bring something to the island. And I was thinking of, you know, what's Bermuda famous for? The Bermuda shorts, like everybody in the world has heard of Bermuda shorts, but as far as I knew, no Bermudian was trying to sell them internationally, so I thought there was definitely potential there. So um, I then went to Central St. Martins, which is one of the fashion schools out there, and did a course there to learn about how to market a fashion brand and just the basics of the production line and how it works. Um, and then just did a lot of reading and a lot of research over about two years. Um, so when I came back from Muda, I then kicked off um, tabs, but also kept a day job as well for quite some time. Now this year alone that you've uh, expanded into women's shorts, mm -hmm. belts, and then swim you had the shorts swim shorts yeah. with the designer or the um, painter, mm -hmm. uh, Graham Foster. Yeah. That's a successful year in itself. Yeah, I mean, Graham Foster was brilliant to work with and his short, you know, everyone loves Graham, so that's been good and I hope to do some more work with him in the future. Um, but yeah, that's been really fun doing the swim shorts because I can take, you know, pretty much any image and digitally print it and, you know, high quality and they're, they're, it's a beautiful product. I'm very proud of that. So. Now, Bermuda Magazine named you uh, first ever Made in Bermuda Award this year. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, that was a huge honor. Um, I'm not actually made in Bermuda, though. It's kind of designed in Bermuda. We actually manufacture it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a huge honor. I was, that, was, that was a very good moment this year. I was very chuffed. That was great. So are you surprised by the, the support that you've had from the community? For sure. I mean, Bermudians are so supportive. I, I can't go, you know... <sighs> Yeah, I can't thank people enough. My customer especially, they're really involved in the product. They will email me, they will follow up, they'll have ideas. A lot of my products are, are born from conversations with people. You know, someone will email me and be like, have you thought about doing Palmetto Green? I'll be like, oh, no, I haven't. Let's do Palmetto Green. And then, you know, you do that. There's a huge amount of rules when it comes yeah. to wearing the Bermuda shorts. Is that something you came up with or are those no. rules the existing? Because, I mean, I see men every day breaking them. Uh, yeah, 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 they do, actually. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just researched and looked into the history of the Bermuda shorts and where they came from and talked to locals as well, which was interesting um, to see what their perspective was on the product um, and how they've been wearing it and how they wanted to wear it. Um, but yeah, there is a whole set of rules for wearing them traditionally. And I, I enjoy sharing that with tourists who come down and, and visitors. And now you've expanded into Singapore and you just mm -hmm. were mentioning Dubai as well. I mean, that's yeah. quite a feat for just two and a half years. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. Um, so yeah, Singapore, we're in a boutique out there and then Dubai, there's some golf resorts that have recently placed an order. Um, but we are international platformers by the website, so I sell internationally through there as well. And it's been really interesting with the America's Cup as to see the increase in sales overseas, um, you know, through the back end of my website, I can see exactly when they're coming. You know, if they're doing a push, they did a, an article on me in France, and within you know two hours, I could see the sales of France were going up on the website. So I've definitely seen an increase through that. Uh, Jimmy Chin, I believe his name is, a photographer, yeah. was just recently here, um, shooting for a Conness Traveler, mm -hmm. and he donned your shorts. And Indeed. I heard that uh, him and his producer were quite impressed with them. Um, and then you were in GQ as well this year, mm -hmm. which is quite the feat. Yeah. Um, who would you like to see wearing your 
your oh. shorts in terms of any celebrity out I'd there. I'd love to see where my shorts probably sounds a bit bizarre. Um, but Pharrell Williams has been recently wearing them to the, you know, Bermuda shorts, not my shorts, unfortunately. But, <laughs> and they're a little bit too long, so I need to tell him about that. Um, but he's been wearing Bermuda shorts with the blazer, and he's almost there with the style, and I would just love to kit him out in a pair of tabs with the knee-high socks and just get him to, like, rock it at the Grammys or something. That would be it. <laughs> but I just can't get hold of him. I'm trying, you know, he just don't pick up his phone. I don't know, you have to send him a sample size. I know, I should, yeah. So you've been around for almost two and a half years, and as you mentioned, you've been working two jobs mm -hmm. for almost that yeah, entire time. Right. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you juggle all these things at the same time? Yeah, it's a good question, time management. Um, I would make tabs part of my day. So I would get up early, I would go to D'Angelini's, I'm sure they know me very well there, um, have my cup of coffee, do an hour's worth of work on tabs then, then my lunch break would be tabs, and then I'd get home at you know, 5.36, and I'd work on tabs until 10.30, 11 o'clock. And then you've got the weekends. So when you start to divide your time that way, you can start to fit extra things in. What are some of the challenges entrepreneurs face? And some people have great ideas, but they don't always make great entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think um, the first step is you have to be really realistic. Like, is the idea going to work? You know, put the research in, run the numbers, make sure that it has longevity. Um, and one of the advice that I gave that workshop was don't quit your day job. I mean, it, it's, it's really tough. Um, but I, I guess my feeling is you have to be prepared to do it and you have to love it enough to do it because it's going to be hard. There's going to be long hours. You're going to make mistakes. Um, there's going to be financial pitfalls at times, but you have to love it enough that it kind of gets your pulse racing and gets you up in the morning. Otherwise, you're not going to last. Uh, earlier, you told me a great story about uh, seeing your product out there internationally when you were visiting New York. Yes. Uh, tell me that story again. That was a very cool moment. So I was in New York um, on a little holiday and um, actually I wasn't on holiday, I was working. <laughs> but um, I was over there and um, across the platform I was about to get on the subway and I saw a guy wearing my Bermuda shorts. And they're so distinctive because of the color and the triangle logo. Um, it was like a little bit of Bermuda had just washed up into New York. It was, that was a moment where I was like, ah, you know, this is starting to spread now. So that was a moment that you almost felt like you made it. Um, what do you think will have to occur for you to actually feel super successful and that, that this brand has taken off? I'd like to be in more department stores internationally. Um, I'd like to be a globally recognized brand. These are all long-term goals, so <laughs> it'll take a long time. Um, I'd like the world to know what Bermuda shorts are really made of. I think I feel, feel successful when I'm like in, you know, Barney's or something, <laughs> it would be good. Um, Summers Cooper had mm -hmm. mentioned in an article in November 2014 that the reaction was unprecedented and that the demand has outstripped supply. Did you expect this kind of reaction? No, <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, hence why I didn't have enough stock. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't. Um, it, it's been amazing. Um, I'm very lucky to have the support of Coopers. They've, they've been huge cheerleaders for me. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a real roller coaster for sure. Um, we've grown really quickly, um, but at the same time, I, I want to do more. So it's constantly like pushing forward and growing bigger. <laughs> An empire. An empire, yeah. Everyone will know what Bermuda shorts are, hopefully. I'd love tabs to be like the Hoover of vacuum cleaners. <laughs> so like, when people say Bermuda shorts, it's like, oh, have you got your tabs on? And any thoughts of opening your own store? At some point, that would be great. Um, I'd love to have a flagship, um, but that will take some time. Um, but we'll get there. Passionate, vocal, and a force to be reckoned with on social media. LGBTQ and human rights activist, Sherry Lynn Pringle, consistently ranks in the top 15 of Bermuda's clout rankings. Sherry Lynn's quest for equality and community enlightenment is peppered with her own personal experiences as a daughter, a wife, mother, and LGBTQ supporter. Not one to hold back her thoughts and opinions on issues facing her island home, she often finds herself in the spotlight. I think some of my the attention that I get is just because I'm very outspoken and I sometimes say things without thinking of the ramifications or consequences. Um, that's something that uh, was put on my report card as a, as a wee one. Um, Sherry Lynn must learn to curb her tongue, but I haven't yet. So sometimes jumping in on issues that some people may not wish to put a face to um, their thoughts uh, puts me out there. You've described yourself as a pansexual. Um, what exactly is that and what does that mean? Um, I could have taken an easy button and just said bisexual. Um, I'm, I'm just attracted to people. Um, I've known that I was 
attracted to the same sex early. About I was about nine years old. Wow. It wasn't about having sex with the person. I just knew that I was madly in love at nine years old with a female who I've never told. And I've never pursued a relationship with them. But I went on and I had a wonderful marriage. I have a child. I love my, I mean, the man who I married. I loved him. Um, I loved my life. I loved my married life. So when was the first time you had a relationship with a woman? 44, 42, 44, something like that. Real relationship, you know, out having a good time, you know, no cares in the world. I was in love. You know, and I still love her. I mean, because she's a great person. What were some of the things that came up when you first entered into a relationship with a woman um, that you might have been surprised about from the community? What was most surprising was was the way my family reacted, um, and maybe that came because I was I, I was already a grown woman. I was at a really really low point at one at one time, and I just reached out and I called Mark called Mark Anderson. And I talked to Mark Anderson, and, and I owe so much to Mark for, for just helping me um, to understand what, I was exp what, what was going on. It was a confusing time for me at that age. So then I started to think, wow, what about a 16-year-old, an 18-year-old? You know, these young people know. And imagine being going through what I went through at that age with maybe no resources. And so then they're, they're, um, they're vulnerable to, to people who, who have other ideas on what being an LGBTQ person should be. You're usually outspoken and, and um, you jump in to the mix of things. Uh, it's usually in the defense of others, though. Have you always been an advocate? Um, I don't think I've I wouldn't call it being an advocate. I, I think back to my early childhood days. Um, in primary school, for instance, if there was the, the person sitting on the side of the bench, on the bench by herself, nobody to play with, I'm the one that would go over there and befriend them. I've just always felt that if you don't agree with something, you have two choices. You say something or you say nothing. And so I've just tried to say something when the opportunity has arisen and the marriage equality one is one that I didn't really choose but I am very supportive of what Tony Brannan and others are trying to do and um, and will speak out for it because I believe it's a right. Were you disappointed that marriage equality wasn't mentioned in the throne speech? No I wasn't expecting it I mean uh, there's everything takes time Having worked um, towards the end of the Two Words and a Commas campaign towards getting sexual orientation added to the Human Rights Amendment, um, Human Rights Act, I understand how long their fight was. If you have something that you want to champion, then start, start championing it, and, and, but be prepared for it to take some time. So will I see um, marriage equality in Bermuda in my lifetime? I really hope so. But if I don't, it, it will be nice to close my eyes knowing that I try to help wherever I could. Do you feel that it's a victory with the Chief Justice uh, recent ruling in terms of same-sex partners being allowed to reside and work in Bermuda um, the same as Bermudian spouses? I think it's a small step towards the greater goal, which is allowing Bermudians who live here and love here to um, participate in everything that comes with marriage and family um, or no family. What is the community like in the LGBTQ community in Bermuda? It's like any other community. It's fragmented. It, it has its little pockets. It has, you know, it has its little cliques and everything and everybody doesn't see eye to eye. It's no different, but um, it's no different than any other type of community. Unfortunately, Speaking out and putting a face to your thoughts and to your activism does comes with a price. And, and, and uh, some of us aren't ready to pay that yet. And I, and I totally understand that, you know. Um, you also have to respect that there are a lot of LGBTQ um, people that are religious, that are Christians. And so, you know, trying to make it seem like the community is not a Christian community or there are not Christians in that community is wrong. 
Um, so then you're done denying your own, you're just denying your own people rights and making the statement of let's focus on other things like jobs and unemployment and the LGBT community is affected by all those things. And in terms of social media, um, you've used that quite a bit uh, as your platform to mm -hmm. not just about this issue, but any issue or anything going on in your personal life. Uh, why are you so active on social media? Like, wh uh, What kind of outlet does it provide for um, you? I love how you can interact with people that you may never get to meet. I love meeting the people that I call friends on social media. And I, you know, I, I make a big deal about that. Um, it, it is a way to get the good, the bad, and the ugly out. Um, how do you remain so positive and you continue to be outspoken even though you've had a series of disappointments? Um, I, I'm going to quote Ciola Wilson who always says, and it may not be her original quote, but any day above ground is a good day. So I just have to look at it like that and just um, I'm happy that I have another day to fight for something, whether it's love or life or um, for somebody else. Professional boxer Nikki Bascom was orphaned at a young age, and although supported by his grandmother and godmother, his early teenage years were trying to say the least. Looking for a way to channel his anger and frustrations, he took up boxing, which would forever change his life. Since turning pro in 2014, Nikki boasts an undefeated record of 4-0. Meeting him in person, you can't really picture this soft-natured, polite, almost shy young man throwing a punch let alone taking down his last opponent in 2 minutes and 33 seconds this past November. He's setting the bar even higher in 2016, encapsulating what it means to get back up when life knocks you down. I still ain't got to that level where, you know, I'm able to have more fun in the ring and be more com comfortable. That's only because I don't get the, the fights on a regular scheduled basis, but I think with time and experience, then I'll rate myself a little higher. But um, I improved a lot with my power, and I'm happy about that. Well, what would you say you really want to focus on for the new year? Um, I just want to improve on the things that I'm working on, like the fundamentals. That's what I believe in fights, and you know, I'm not really worried about the fancy stuff. It's just improve on the fundamentals, my defense, and picking up my fitness. Let's talk about the Eric Ray's uh, fight that happened mm -hmm. in November. It was about two minutes and 33 seconds, and then it was over. Uh, do you wish that the fight had gone on a little bit longer just to entertain the crowd a bit? Yeah, definitely. Like I said earlier, like you know, if I had more fights and more experience, I would have been able to, let's say, um, give the people some, you know, some to look at, you know, just play around. Because I knew deep down in my heart that I was a little better than this guy. But me and my coaches on that level now, where it's like you can't please everybody, we have a job to do, and that's win. And if the knockout's available, take it. Is there anything that goes on in your head while you're running or pushing yourself? I just remember doing hill sprints, and my trainer's voice would be in my head <laughs> saying, it's not going to hurt forever, and you do another yeah, sprint. Definitely, definitely. Um, positive, positive thoughts, you have negative thoughts. Um, you know, you have critics, you have people you know, that like me, don't like me. It's all going to my head. I'm human, you know, but I just try to stay focused and, po and, and positive. And, you know, that's what I do. I just push. I use it as motivation. Do you feel like you've made it when you have someone like um, Jimmy Spittle, Team Oracle USA skipper, and uh -huh. um, saying you have incredible skills, incredible talent, uh -huh. and then Clarence Hill, of course, and Troy Darrell all um, talking about your talent. Does that ever hit you? Yeah. Yeah, it does, but I'm never satisfied. You know, I feel like I could do way better. I feel like people haven't really seen the best out of me because, you know, when I'm away training, I'm sparring with top guys, so they haven't really seen the best come out of me. So, you know, um, I appreciate it and it feels good, yeah. You go away to a training camp in Florida before each fight. Um, in terms of the boxing community here and being able to spar with other fighters, how is the community? Um, here it's starting to pick up. Um, it's a good thing for the whole sport in general in Bermuda. But we're, 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 we're far behind. We're far behind. What would you like to see happen? Um, more unity. More, um, more, more uh, 
sparring between the GMs because I feel if everybody's in one GM sparring against the same people, you're not going to grow. Do you have young fighters coming up to you asking to train with you or spar with you? Well, I'm sure they're a little bit hesitant yeah. to spar with you. But. Yeah, they, they like training with me. It's more like they observe how I train more than ask them to train. A lot of them just come to the gym and they observe. Um, you know, they can't keep up. They, <laughs> they can't keep up, you know, take them on runs and stuff. But it, it helps me to push myself because I know they want to be in my position. So it keeps me hungry. And, you know, when I'm normally doing five miles, I push to seven. What would you say to individuals that are a little bit younger than yourself or in your age bracket um, in terms of focus? Like, how, how do you prepare and how do you focus? Um, just, you know, don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to be an outcast. You know, just, you know, whatever it is you're good at, put your focus and time into it because, you know, hard work pays off at the end of the day. And, you know, you have to believe in yourself and use the people that is available to help you. You know, most people help you because they want to help you, so use them. And, um, you know, don't be afraid. You know, just because we come from this small island, don't be afraid to just chase your dream because, you know, what you put in is what you get out. So when did that change for you? Because you had said originally that um, you got into boxing because you were unhappy. Um, and you were smoking weed, stealing mm. bikes, um, <laughs> not going to school, yeah. getting kicked out of school. Yeah. So when did you have that moment where you wanted to make a change in your life? I think it was also because I was fighting too, and um, I like to fight. It's weird. Um, and I had that anger built up, and when I started boxing and I was getting challenged, when we was going on runs with other people that was there for like longer than me, and I was losing. And guys were beating me in races, it made me like, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't like to lose, so it's like, I need to dedicate myself more. And before you know it, I was beating them and running, and I felt good about myself. If I didn't change my ways, then I'll be still in the same place. So it's like that in boxing. Like, if I don't train, if I don't wake up and go run five, six miles, if I don't eat the right foods, I don't have nobody else to blame but myself if I lose. And that's the same way in life, because I, I believe boxing is an art. And they say art imitates life, right? In terms of your support system, what does that look like? Uh, it's great. Um, I have my girlfriend, she's got my back. I have my coach and his, uh, his wife. I have other coaches in the gym who um, push me. They wake up early in the morning to meet me at the field to do to work. Um, I have friends on um, Fresh and Hungry. They support me, they believe in me. And all the fans, the community, they just believe in me. And it gives me that strength to go out there and train. So what are your goals for 2016? Um, I want to have four fights next year, each quarter. And Locally or abroad? It don't matter. Um, it's whatever. Um, I just want to improve my racket to 8-0 by the end of the year, at least. So, you know, I want to get up to the sixth round of fights and to the eight rounders. Hopefully I can get to the eight rounds the last quarter of the year. Um, and I want my brand, Fresh and Hungry, to expand, um, just like how you see other brands, Adidas. You know, I just want my brand to ex expand locally, worldwide. So there's a whole goal of life after boxing as well. Yeah, definitely. Like many survivors of child sexual abuse, Debbie Ray Rivers would see her perpetrator freely walking the streets, serving as a constant reminder of the abuse, which a staggering estimated one in three females and one in five males in Bermuda will be victims to. When the same fate tragically befell a member of her immediate family, Debbie knew she had to act, not only to heal, but to bring the plight of these child victims out of the dark and into the light. In 2011, after hearing her story, local businessman John Brunson joined forces with Debbie to form SCARS, saving children and revealing secrets. Since then, close to 4,000 residents have participated in their Stewards of Children's Sexual Abuse Prevention Training. The SCARS isn't just about prevention, they also work with adult survivors, helping them take that important first step of revealing in order to heal. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, statistics will tell us that 
uh, more than 90% of the time, the perpetrator is known to their victim. Um, and so when you really start to uh, add color to what that means, it really changes the dynamic about how you think about child protection. Um, the idea of stranger danger is less of a risk to our children than, uh, than people that know them and people that we trust. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, black or white, you live in Tucklestown or Middlestown, um, it just doesn't matter. And that um, in order to really protect our children, you have to um, really think about the risks that are there and how you can minimize those. So Debbie, uh, in speaking your own story and your own truth, uh, how challenging was that at first to be able to reveal that, that part of your life that obviously uh, must be very painful to be able to bring up again? Yeah, it was. Um, I think the place that I had to get to was to know that all of it was none of our faults. Um, as a survivor myself of sexual abuse, um, I had to understand that what happened to me, um, I was too young to understand, um, and that um, people who, the two people that did this to me and stole my innocence, um, took advantage took advantage because I was vulnerable, I was young, I was confused. And so um, the first thing I had to do to break through this wall of shame, because that's what it is, um, is to understand that I did nothing wrong and I didn't cause it. And you were just talking about how many local residents have been trained in your, in your workshops and your education programs. Uh, we're at about, you were just saying, 3,800 local residents. In 2013, you had mentioned that your goal for the next five years was to have 2,250 local residents trained. Are you overwhelmed with the response from the community? We, yeah, we certainly are, and I think this is an attest, a testament to the fact that it's needed, that we're ready, Bermuda's ready to heal. That's what we're mm -hmm. doing. By addressing child sexual abuse, we're healing our people. I, mean, I would say, I remember when we first started, Debbie and I, we trained about 150 stewards. And it was just Debbie and I, and we thought, how are we going to keep this pace up? We're exhausted. Um, and four years on, you know, we're now at almost 3,800 uh, trained stewards. Our training is seven days a week, Monday to Sunday, seven nights a week. Um, and we have 42 facilitators that this would not be possible without, and also a board that provides direction um, for us as well. So. Um, it, it, this, is a, this is a testament to everybody um, who's part of um, the SCARS team, and we're just really proud and grateful. The work that we've done um, and the support that we have have in the community and those that have uh, become advocates in our Stewards of Children training, um, they have become a part of a movement that has put Bermuda in the forefront of tackling this issue on the world stage. Mm -hmm. I think it is true to say that Bermuda is one of a very small minority of countries that can say more than 10% of its adult population has been trained in child protective training. Now you had mentioned prevention. What are some of the methods uh, we can take in terms of prevention? Well, I mean, there's uh, in our Stewards of Children training, we uh, provide the construct uh, behind uh, the tools. Um, and those tools are grounded on three basic fundamentals. and those fundamentals are, um, first, making choices. And understanding that when we talk about this issue of child sexual abuse, um, there's choices that we have to make. And, uh, you know, many times people will choose a path of least resistance. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to expose the family. They don't want to suffer the shame. Um, or they just opt to do nothing and typically what we call sweep it under the carpet. Um, the next it, uh, principle is taking risks. Um, and taking risks simply says is that we have to step outside our comfort zone to do the right thing. If you think that, um, you know, a child has either discovered that a child has been sexually abused either through dis discovery, disclosure, or suspicion, um, then it forces you, especially those that are mandated to report, to take action. And you're accountable for that action. Um, and so it feels risky, especially in a small community like Bermuda. Um, and um, so, you know, taking risk is, is another key principle. And lastly is supporting each other. Um, people uh, are more likely to uh, address this issue and take it head on if they know that they're supported. 
the work that SCARS is doing in the community is not only reducing children from being sexually abused, but I think we're also reducing the amount of sex offenders because we're learning back boundaries. We're teaching boundaries at a young age, at a very early age, that children are not to touch others and nobody should touch them. So what is your thoughts then on a sex offender registry? You know, we, we do believe and support the idea of a public sex offenders registry, um, but we think that real reform in uh, the, the, the community is, is required in that mandatory treatment, um, sex offender management, um, a registry of some sort, whether it's public or not, um, preventative training, um, making it mandatory, uh, and then um, redefining, rewriting our laws so that we have tougher penalties that will serve as more of a deterrent for anyone who would even contemplate the idea. The sex offenders list main purpose is not to shame sex offenders. It's to protect children. And I think that's what we have to wrap our heads around. And in terms of the throne speech initi initiatives we saw this year that were mentioned, were you happy with some of the things that the, the government is willing to work on or is planning to work on? Um, they formed a joint select committee of the House of Assembly and we've been working with them on reform. Um, so we think that that's positive. You know, we've met with the Premier on this issue and his permanent secretary and they're supportive of the direction that we're going in. And we know that the governor and his wife and the assistant uh, deputy governor uh, support what we're doing. And just last question, but what is your end goal or end vision for SCARS? What would you like to see happen? You seem like you found success already. Yeah, every adult to hear this message. Every new parent, even every young adult that ha is not a parent yet, um, to, to see what they can do to save their children um, from this crime. And, um, and I think we're going to accomplish that. We'd like every organization that is entrusted with the care of children to hear the message and then to put policies and procedures in place that will reduce the risk. Um, so that's our goal, every adult. And, yeah. and we're not going to stop until that happens. Already versed in running, swimming, and biking, a fearless eight-year-old decided to try her first triathlon and hasn't looked back. 20 years later, professional triathlete Flora Duffy dominated 2015 with a series of victories. Her laundry list of accomplishments include ITU, Cross Triathlon World Champion, Xterra Mountain Champion, Xterra Asian Pacific Champion, Xterra South Africa Champion, a bronze win at the 2015 Pan Am Games in Toronto, and in her final race of the season, she defended her title as Xterra Triathlon World Champion. But Flora's biggest achievement in 2015 was actually not one of her first place wins. Yeah, you know, this year it, it really took me by surprise. You know, when I, I laid out my race schedule, it was pretty ambitious, um, you know, between all the Xterra, Pan Ams, ITU stuff. And, um, you know, funnily enough, it's not a race I won. It's not the bronze medal at Pan Ams. It's actually a race I was fourth at. And most people, when they finish fourth, are like, oh man, you know, off the podium, awkward spot. But it was in Stockholm, it was an ITU race. Um, it was a really great field, and for the first time ever, I was, felt like I was, you know, at that level to be competitive in the race, be a game changer, be in that lead pack on the run, and, um, you know, I outran some of, the, some of the best people in the sport, you know, behind me fifth was Nicholas Spierig, who won the gold in London, and, you know, just to be able to rub shoulders with her, like, it finally felt like, okay, you know, I can do this, and I crossed the line in fourth and was super happy, and, um, no, that was definitely my best performance and the race that I probably cherished the most from this year. At 18, I think it was, you went to the Commonwealth Games for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, where do you get the confidence? You know, racing pro, racing for your country, racing at a Games, it's a whole nother level. Like, I might have looked cool and calm on the outside, but at 18 years old, towing the line with literally the best girls in the world at the time, it was my first big race, is in Australia. Like, you know, it was unbelievable, and um, I don't know, you just dive into that water and you get into your zone, and you know, I, I know how to swim, bike, run, and so once it starts, I just do my thing, and yeah, it was pretty incredible that it, it all went to plan, and I ended up finishing eighth, and I was mixing it with some of the top girls, and um, yeah, it's looking back on it, that's probably my highlight so far in my career. Now, as we talked about, this is a phenomenal year for you, um, and everyone sees all of these great things that you're doing. But we were talking about some of the setbacks you experienced throughout your career. Um, there was an eating disorder, there was the Beijing Olympics, and then you quit, um, and then you came back, and then there was London as well, where you had a mechanical problem with the bike. Um, where do you get your perseverance from? 
How do you can how do you continue when all these things are going wrong? Yeah, you know, it's it's really been a roller coaster ride. Um, but you know, I think everyone has their own little little roller coaster. Whether you know, mine was in within sport and just in life, it's always filled with ups and downs. And you know, it's always been a goal of mine to race full time as a professional athlete since I was a little kid. And so, you know, of course, there was moments when I thought, no way, I can't do this. And I took two years out of the sport and I went to university and I became a full on like college student, joined a sorority. And it was kind of through that, I was like, this this is just not me. This is not the lifestyle I want to live. And then slowly got in, back into sport, found my motivation, had a little bit of success. And I was like, okay, well, let me just keep doing this. And then the success kind of came a little more. And, um, you know, it just kind of builds slowly and slowly. And finally, you know, it's t like 2015 and I finally feel like I'm have my feet on the ground and can can race well and mix with the girls. Um, so it's just taking time and I, honestly, I don't know where I've got the perseverance from. I think you have to be a little crazy to, to do this elite sport, so maybe that's why. Well, it's a lot of hard work too behind the scenes that people don't see. They see you coming in at the end and you've got a big smile on your face with the Bermuda flag and crossing the finish line, but they're not seeing all of the hours that it takes. As you said, the nutrition is a big part as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, leading up into a race, particularly the last eight weeks, like I'm, I'm like the least social person ever. You don't, you're not drinking, you're watching what you're eating, you're eating things at specific times, like everything is pretty calculated and you want to be so that you can be in your best shape for race day. You know, and I'm training 25 plus hours a week, and then you add in massage there, which is kind of a crucial thing for recovery, um, and all of those sorts of things. It really leaves you with no time, and then you want to be in bed at 9 p.m. because you're starting the next day early. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a whole lifestyle that goes into you know, crossing this line with a smile on your face, um, which, you know, for me, it's fine. That, that's what I love to do, but it's, it's definitely it takes its toll and you need some breaks throughout the year. So how's your training program going to adapt to prep for the 2016 Rio Olympics? Yeah, so over 2016, we, we laid out, when I say we, my coach and I, we laid out my racing schedule. Um, so that's, you know, step one and how, to, how we're, you know, forming next year to build up for August, which is when the Olympics are. So I'll be in South Africa until May, and um, there'll be a big bulk of racing, sort of April, May time of the year. Um, and then I get like a six week break, do a race in July, no June, sorry, and then it's a six week break and it's Rio. Do you get anxious before you, you race? I imagine something like the Olympics would be very daunting. Yeah, the Olympics, that, that's sort of next level, sort of, uh, you know, nerves, it's on like the, the, the world platform, everyone's watching, you know, people that don't even know about the sport all of a sudden are like, what's this triathlon? Oh, Flora, and you know, especially being here from Bermuda, you know, we don't have a huge team going. So it's, it's like me and maybe six or seven others. And so you get a lot of pressure and a lot of focus is on you. And, you know, you just have to learn to adapt to that and cope with it, which is, you know, what I have done. This is I'm a professional athlete. It's kind of part of the package. Now your sports philosophy is, I believe, pain is temporary, but glory is forever. Mm -hmm. What does glory look like for you? Ooh, what does glory look like? Yeah, it's funny, I, I don't know, I learned that saying, I don't, don't even know where I picked it up, but it stuck with me. And yeah, you know, and I guess glory is sort of achieving the goals that I want. You know, whether it's winning the race or whether it's fourth place or, you know, just feeling like, I'm one performing the best that I can and, and doing what I can to perform that way and you know also having like a positive impact in the sport and promoting you know Bermuda the best way that I can you know I'm very proud to be Bermudian and I love racing for Bermuda and sort of giving it exposure um, through through sport um, you know hopefully I'm uh, inspiring some young young little Bermudians to take part in sport um, but, you know, ultimately, like, I guess glory is, you know, uh, winning the races and being the best you can be. This fisherman's son from Whitehill has certainly made a name for himself. Controversy and headlines have followed the Progressive Labour Party leader, Mark Bean, throughout much of 2015. But the opposition leader doesn't mind if his leadership style ruffles a few feathers. The 41-year-old attributes his advancement within the party to, quote, merit, ability, clean hands and pure heart and has recently been pushing for a good governance act to pass in Parliament. His communication style in and out of the House of Assembly has landed him in hot water, including a court case that was later dismissed and other threats of legal action from former Premier Europe Brown, who once mentored the young leader. 
Mr. Breen has also been squashing rumors that his own leadership position is in jeopardy. Um, my, my leadership is solid. Um, the party has made it clear that they support the approach I am taking. I'm not going to speak of the internal um, apparatus and how it operates, but rest assured that I would expect to continue as the leader of my party and one day the premier of our country. And I will meet the expectations of not only my members, but also those who do not support the Progressive Labor Party and will never vote for the Progressive Labor Party. That's my responsibility. And so I have to be that agent of change. I, I'm, I'm being backed by at least 75% of the membership. And uh, I will continue to, to exercise um, my responsibilities and fulfill my obligations. Simple. Now, much like the Premier, mm -hmm. you evoke an emotion in the people of Bermuda, positive mm -hmm. or negative. Yes. Why do you think that is? Um, it all depends. Uh, you ask me the negative, I could probably um, speculate. And if you ask me the positive, I can speculate. Um, I cannot speak for the premier, but when you are a politician or a political leader, the environment in this country basically ensures that half the people are going to hate you and half will like you. That's just what it is. And it's nothing to do with one's personality. It's just the sides of the fence that you sit on. Um, you might see some people even within my party, like, like I'm sure the Premier has, uh, resistance to my approach and style to leadership. But I have to make it clear that I serve uh, at the will and pleasure of the people. And uh, I have received a mandate from my party delegates and members that says, leader, clean up our party. Clean up the way we think, clean up the way we act, because obviously the current government is not meeting the expectations of the country and we cannot be repetitious and mimic what's come before. And so if, regardless if people like me or, or don't like me, they'll never be able to say that Mark Bean is not trustworthy, Mark Bean is not frank, Mark Bean is not honest, Mark Bean does not have clean hands. Mark Bean does not advocate policies that either increase the dependency or increase the divide amongst uh, the population. You never heard me say it. I never have, never will. And when you come in and take an approach like that, naturally, it's going to create some anxiety. Now, you had mentioned a goal was to become the leader of the country. What well, would you that's not really a goal, but I'm the opposition leader and the next election, I could quite possibly become the premier of the country. Yeah. And what would you say to those that might say that that idea scares them? Yeah, well, if you look at the other 35 members in Parliament, the idea was if you put or replace those persons with me, it would scare a lot of people too, because we are all humans. But a lot of this fear, which is manufactured, is to destroy the confidence in the people towards me. But I have a relationship with people that cannot be broken because of propaganda. What you see is what you get. And my approach might create anxiety in the country, but again, as long as I know that I'm doing what's right instead of what I like, eventually, if people don't appreciate me now, history will, and that's what comes. Um, you've been called harsh, <laughs> misogynist, yeah, homophobic, yeah. xenophobic. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment of Mark Bean? Far from it, far from it. But um, for me, when I use the English language, I use the English language to describe behavior. It just so happens again that in this environment, um, it's to be, when someone describes behavior, they are actually sinning or committing a crime, but uh, people ignore the actual behavior. I have actually used language that's very um, graphic in Parliament and outside of Parliament, so the people can understand the gravity of the situation. Um, one time I used language, ladies of the night, which naturally was taken and blown out of proportion, but I received permission from the Speaker of the House to use that language because I wanted to convey what I felt is the attitude of the Minister, Michael Fay, and the government in terms of immigration policy and how they treat Bermudians. As a leader, shouldn't I point out danger? Shouldn't I point out issues that our people have to be aware? And to wake you up out of your slumber, I might need to use language to get your attention but it was never, ever an attack on the women of the OBA. 
Well, that's a good segue into my next question. Um, you do surround yourself with very strong women in your life. You've often sure. referenced your wife yeah. um, in terms of legal battles that you've mm -hmm. gone to her for advice. Mm -hmm. uh, you referenced your mother earlier, your sister. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that runs counter to some of the things that you have said about women? What have I said about women? What about the Tony Daniels situation? Well, first of all, I got, there was no case to answer. Second of all, I am a leader, okay? I am a real man. When I see a sister, Right? in my opinion, being used and abused in the political process, okay? and then attacking my people all right, publicly, then it's a problem because now I have to hurl back my people to respond. When I see you face to face, instead of saying it through the media, I let you know that there is a lot of information about your behavior, your activities within the One Bermuda Alliance that I have not allowed anyone to use against you publicly but yet you want to attack my candidate. Am I to set aside my manhood, my integrity as a man, the love that I have for women, to, to allow them to sit back and to be used and abused for the political process, or shall I open my mouth and constructively try to help the sister? When you come in the room with the PLP, there's no gender bias in the PLP. We have had multiple female leaders. They are my mentors. When you come into the Progressive Labour Party under my leadership, you are advanced based on merit and merit alone. Do you understand me? Merit and merit alone. Well, let's move on to the House, um, where you had fire exchanges with uh, the Speaker of the House, Randy Horton, yeah, yeah. Uh, throughout this year. Yeah. How is your relationship currently with him? It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's cordial, you know, but at the same time, we understand <laughs> what the deal is. and. Uh, and so we just have to uh, wait till it plays out, that's all. You seem to um, stand strongly behind what you say, even in reflection. Has there ever been a moment where you regret saying something? In, in politics? No. In life? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I am a man with many weaknesses, okay? Many weaknesses as a man. I am far from perfect. I do not set, my, set myself up to be some paragon of virtue, right? And so I, I am human. But in terms of uh, politics and leadership, I say what I mean, I mean what I say, and then I seek to do it. And that way um, I can live up to this title that I have before my name, which is called honorable. You can't be honorable if you're not honest, all right? So I seek to live it. I, I don't seek to, to say it and, or just talk it. And, and no, I have no regret for anything that I've said uh, since I've been in politics because, um, quite frankly, everything I've said has been based on facts and the truth or the search for truth. Now, if I had made errors, I would apologize for it. I would apologize. But would I regret making an error? No, because that's part of life experience and learning. Um, as long as I'm in politics, as long as I'm alive, I will continue to learn and to improve. But no, I don't have no regrets. Anything. Mm -mm. Do you feel that your message is sometimes buried with all of, of the course. other things the that greatest, people tend to the focus greatest on? Fear, the greatest fear that the powers that be, regardless of where they sit, the greatest fear is that they do not want the public to hear me speak to them as we are now. That's the greatest fear. Because that removes the veil that they have created, the manufactured veil that Mark Mean is everything but a son of God. Okay? Because when I do speak personally, just like we are doing now, you, you're able to tap into a bit of my soul because I will open up to you to express myself. I'm not going to hide anything. You have a thick skin, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Is there something, though, that you'd want the general public to know about you yeah. that they aren't aware of? Yeah. I, I am a man that, at my best, I'm extremely self-disciplined. I'm extremely quiet. Um, generally speaking, I am soft. Right? Um, I'm not hard, um, unless I have to be hard. Um, yeah, and I'm easy to approach. I'm not a socialite, so don't expect to see me cocktailing in receptions, having little light conversations. That's not what I do. I spend most of my time in study, contemplation, and meditation. The correlation between meditation 
and when you're in the house and there are those moments that you're in the heat of things, yes. um, your message we talked about previously sometimes yes. gets lost because of that, some yes. of the things you say. Yes. Is that a goal for 2016? Yeah, absolutely, but I also hope that people start to listen more. Don't be swayed with, with the propaganda of the media. But if I can be more preventative, yes. There was an opportunity just Friday going where the Speaker of the House blatantly broke the rules again. And many people might have thought that I would have reacted um, as they have seen in the past. I just smiled and sat down because the racket history will record it. I'm not, I'm not getting into those battles anymore. Have you always had your family support when it comes to politics and do you continue to have their support? Absolutely. Um, that's really the only support I do have uh, when, when the rubber hits the road. Um, our mother uh, died in 1990. Yeah, 1990. And so I was 16. Uh, we have one sister who is the second oldest. She maintains that motherly, matriarchal uh, figure, the glue within, within uh, my family. Um, but I have three brothers, Alan, uh, Alan Jr., sorry, Cornell, who's a golf professional, and Dalvin, who you already know. And all my siblings, and my father, and my wife, and my children, and uncles and aunts, they're very supportive of me, very, very supportive of me. And it's always been that way and will always be that way. He stepped into power during a time of controversy in May 2014, and his time at the helm since has been no easy ride. Known to some as the Milkman, OBA Premier Michael Dunkley received his fair share of criticism and praise in 2015. He ended the year favorably in the polls despite disapproval over government and union relations, a surge in crime and questionable government contracts and the Jetgate scandal continues to surface. Despite strong political opposition, Premier Dunkley has steamed ahead, publicly boasting economic growth and the much-toted America's Cup events. We're making progress. We are we're out of the recession. The economic indicators show that that uh, to be the case. But still, we have a lot of work to make because there's still too many people hurting. There's still too many Bermudians that are looking for a job or in a job that is not their first choice. And so the work must continue. And I'm positive that we will continue to make strides because there's a lot of opportunity that's still there and we're knocking on that door and we're opening the door for that opportunity, whether it be construction projects that are very close to getting into the ground or whether it be the planning for the America's Cup uh, in 2017 as a backdrop to the awesome races we had in October of, of this year for the Louis Vuitton World Series. Uh, in terms of employment, how confident are you that you'll see an increase in positions arising in the new year? I think we will see increased employment levels. We've seen it with the uh, economic stats that have been put out through the year that the employment level, uh, unemployment level has dropped from 9 to 7 percent, but still that's way too high. And especially the unemployment level for uh, young people is much higher than that and it's still way too high. And I think we'll see progress on that with, with the jobs that are going to be coming forward for construction and those assorted areas. Confidence was shattered through this recession. And confidence is a very fleeting thing no matter what you look at it in in life. And with that confidence being shattered, while we've grown in confidence in Bermuda, and that's very clear if you take a look at some of the indicators and some of the surveys that have been out there, that confidence is still starting to come back. Businesses are going to make sure that uh, when they hire, it's the right time to hire because they feel they can make a return on their investment. It's up to us now as a government to continue to make sure we build that confidence and give the business organizations the structure, the foundation they need to be confident moving forward. Now, much like the opposition leader, Mark Bean, you both seem to strike a chord with people, positive and negative, on both sides. Why do you think that is? I think that uh, if you're in a, in a position where you're going to be in the focus, whether you're a business leader, whether you're a politician or a sportsman or a community activist, we live in a world now that the that spotlight, the sunshine of public scrutiny can be on you quite easily through all the various social media and everything else in between that. Um, and as the Premier of Bermuda, uh, I've made sure that people can reach out to me. The opposition get a bit upset at times that they say I'm always around and you know, photo opportunities and all that. But I cast that against the backdrop. If I stayed in the office all day pouring over paper, people wouldn't have the opportunity to have access to you. They wouldn't know what you stood for and they'd be complaining because you were inside, out of the way and out of sight. I think people want a leader that's accessible and that's real 
And you know, when you get involved in politics, you come from all walks of life. People need to know that I'm accessible and I'm real and I'm just like them. Now, let's talk a little bit about the party. Um, the PLP recently said that the OBA has had a bout of scandals, broken promises, and a lack of transparency. What do you think about that assessment? I would expect that from opposition. That's them um, doing their job. I think there's no uh, fertile ground for that. Uh, one of the things that I am comforted by in my time as Premier since May of last year, I've always been very open and transparent. If you look at our record, we bought patty legislation and made it happen within a couple of months of becoming the Premier. That had sat around for years. One must question why. Change the ministerial code of conduct to make it uh, have more teeth and be have more oversight. We've put all the ministerial travel on a website where people can look into it. We've opened up government boards to get more, more participation specifically for women who want to serve. I will do everything I can to make sure that good governance is a part of every breath that we take uh, on the island here. And I realize in doing that, you open yourself up for much more scrutiny. And that's fine, because I think as politicians, what you do should be answerable to people all the time. And so I'm proud of the record. And, but I just chuckle with the opposition, because clearly, uh, while they seem to have a focus in on uh, good governance and all of those related type of things, they seem to have amnesia about uh, what took place before 2012. That's cool. And there are those that might argue that the OBA is selling off Bermuda. Would you, what, what would you say to those critics? I would say that, to be blunt, it's nonsense. What the OBA is trying to get Bermuda to be open for business again, trying to grow our economy and take care of our people. We've seen unprecedented struggles by Bermudians over the past couple of years, something that I haven't seen in my lifetime, 57 years now, as a Bermudian. Why would I sell off Bermuda? Where do we have to go? I've lived here all my life. Been away for seven years in school, but the rest of the time I've been here in Bermuda. I'm part of the pulse that makes up Bermuda. 65,000 people make up our pulse. I would never sell off Bermuda. And I think that's probably just a catchy political phrase that doesn't do us any good as we try to move forward. Because I can say, I can turn it back around and say to those who say that, that, well, what about those policies? Didn't that sell Bermuda off and, and put us down in the doldrums? I'd rather focus in on where we need to go. We're not selling off Bermuda. We're trying to make sure Bermuda is sustainable for our people with opportunity and hope. It's about the next generation. Let's talk about becoming Premier. Was that an aspiration of yours, and did you expect it? I think the, the straight answer to that is, once you get involved in anything, you would believe that there'd be opportunities to move up. I knew I'd been involved in politics long enough that uh, I had the leadership potential. And I stayed out of the leadership contest uh, when the OBA was formed. Uh, straight up, I told people, I was, it was my goal to go stay in constituency number 10 and win. And I had no desire at that time. In politics, you never know when that opportunity or people will come knocking on your door and ask you to take up the baton. Now you had mentioned family life. Uh, you've been 20 years almost in the, the public eye. Uh, it must have taken a toll somewhat on family life. It has. I remember when I first got involved, one of the conversations that I had with my wife, who gives me great advice all the time, she's the silent force um, beside me at all times, was we have to consider the family. We had two young girls uh, at that time, still very much in their young formative years going to school, and it was a real balance but uh, I think I did a fairly good job. If you ask her at times, it might not seem that way, but I think I've done a fairly good job of trying to balance that. Um, but you know, when you get involved in politics, you can't pick the optimum time to jump overboard. The opportunities arise and you have to decide if you're gonna open that door or you're gonna try to wait for another day. I very rarely r wait. I make a decision and uh, you have to move on it. Life's just too short. Let's chat a little bit about the man behind Premier Dunkley yourself. You've been called a social media statesman. Um, why, why do you think the medium is so important for you and do you consider yourself a brand? Um, that's a good question. Do you consider yourself a brand? I'd like to make um, Bermuda a brand and me be part of that brand. You know, we, we have a lot to be proud of in Bermuda, um, but we have a lot of challenges that we have to face. And one of the reasons why I'm out there in social media is because 
people need to be able to know what you're doing. They need to be in touch with what you're doing. They need to be able to reach out to you. And you know, I guess the person behind who I am is one that I just have, um, I don't know, I was blessed with the ability just to wake up in the morning and want to attack the day. Energy and drive. And you know, I can thank my parents for that because my father always installed in me the value of getting up and doing something with your day. I even remember on weekends you know, when we had an opportunity to do some stuff around the house or get out and play in the neighborhoods or whatever. My father always was strict on, look, you guys are going to do these type of things first before you move forward. So I, I just appreciate the time that you have in a day to do things. And then, you know, I reflect back uh, with the strong upbringing I had as parents. They, they really cast their stamp on who me and my brother and two sisters are. And then when, you, when I look back and, and I recall um, when my father died at 40, I was just 15 or 16 years old. The fragility of the world rocked our family because you know, as a man, uh, he was my hero. I was a young boy. And I'm thinking, wait a second. You know, I saw him at Christmas. I was away at school at the time. Snuffed out just like that. You know, with a phone call from away that I'm coming home and he's not well. And then I started to say, well, you know, life's too short. You have to give everything every day. And so my day is going to be driven by energy and drive to get things done. And, you know, thankfully my family understands, my wife understands the passion that I have to do things and supports me at 100%. So behind what I am, what people see, it's just drive. That's all it is, drive. And it doesn't matter if, if I'm not premier tomorrow, I'm still going to be driven to do what I like to do. A spinal defect at birth may have prevented Jessica Lewis from walking, but that didn't stop her from becoming a track sprinting gold medal winner at last year's Para Pan Am Games in Toronto. Known affectionately by local media as the golden girl of Bermuda sport, the 2015 IBC World Championship bronze medal winner and Paralympian was born weighing only 3.5 pounds and is credited for shining the spotlight on the Paralympic community in Bermuda. There's no doubting that Jessica Lewis has captured the attention and hearts of many in Bermuda, and that's what makes her our most fascinating person of 2015. Um, my coach kind of calls it my coming out year, um, and I'm, I'm truly grateful to my sponsors, Tokyo Millennium Re, who um, bought my new track chair um, this year. Um, so I, I definitely think um, having the equipment helped a lot this year. Um, just because uh, new chairs we get, um, we have upholstery seating so that you're able to adjust how you're sitting um, just because we don't know what is the best position right when you start. Um, so once we got that nailed down um, and then I transferred into my new chair, um, which is now a hard panel. So now when I'm putting power into the wheel, all the power is going into the chair instead of moving me. Um, so I'm pretty much solid in the chair, which makes a huge difference. But we were having this conversation how um, the pair of Pan Am medal is just the Pan American countries, um, which is pretty amazing. And then um, to come away with a medal at the World Championships was absolutely incredible just because it's uh, more athletes around the world and, and more countries. So, yeah, it's pretty great to be up there with them. How do you focus mentally for the, those kind of races? Um, I mean, the 100 uh, at pair of Pan Am, um, the final was the night after my 800. Uh, final and the 800 didn't go as well as I had hoped um, so I was I lost a little bit of focus but my coach kind of brought me back in and and I think just knowing that the 100 meter was the race that we were um, going for at that competition um, kind of helped me as well. You've experienced something that few people have and that's being on a podium. Yeah. What is that feeling like? Oh it was absolutely incredible like I got goosebumps it was amazing and to watch the Bermuda flag race was absolutely incredible. And you called the chair the Pink Panther, correct? <laughs> Where did that name come from? Um, actually, my friend um, at school, um, when she first saw the chair, she's like, oh, it looks like a panther, and then it has like the pink um, steering. So she's like, oh, we should call it the Pink Panther. And of course, pink is my favorite color, so that was like perfect, yeah. And so for next year, what are some of the goals? Obviously, Rio's on there, but what else are you looking at? Um, mainly Rio right now is, is our main goal. In my classification, um, because uh, in in uh, disability sports, they have different classifications, so you're racing against people of your own ability. Um, so I'm a T53 racer, which means that um, my core muscles aren't really there, um, whereas a 54 would have better core strength. Um, so 51 to 54 are your spinal cord injuries. 
um, and then you have a whole bunch of different classes. Um, so my classification, um, the, at Rio there will only be the 100, 400, and 800, and I do 1, 2, 4, and 8. Um, so right now we're training um, for the 400 and 800 just because we know the 100 is pretty good right now. Um, so the longer ones aren't my strongest yet, so we're working on developing power and strength um, and doing like more, uh, a little bit more distance work uh, in our training. When I'm at school, um, obviously I have to balance track and, and uh, school work, so I'm taking uh, three courses instead of five just to balance it all. Um, so I'll work out in the gym three days a week with a personal trainer lifting weights for about half an hour uh, a session. And then um, the other days I'll be in my track chair um, and then just depending on how I'm feeling that day, if I need a rest day or um, how close we are to a competition. Um, and sometimes I'll double up so that I can have a day off. In terms of sacrifice, it's, it's huge for an athlete. Uh, a lot of things that they have to miss out on. You spend your weekends training at your coach's place. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so on Friday nights, um, I get on a bus um, at Brock University, right um, in the center of the university, and it takes me to square one in Mississauga, where my coach picks me up. Um, so that bus ride's probably two hours or so. Um, so I do that every Friday, and then um, I get back on the bus Sunday night um, and go back to uh, Brock that night. Um, so I do that every week. Um, and then I'll train during the week. Uh, my coach will send me what to do, and then um, he'll like modify stuff um, on the weekend. Or and that's when I train uh, with his other athletes as well. Where does that kind of dedication come from? Um, I mean, I just love the sport so much that it's not really that big of a deal to me. Like, um, I mean, there are some weekends where it's like, okay, like, um, especially when it's snowing, like it's like, okay, I have to take all this stuff to the bus. But um, I mean, I just love it so much that it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. In terms of para sports in Bermuda, you've accomplished a lot of firsts. I'm just, I have a long list here, so I have to read it all. I can't even memorize it all. In 2011, you became the first athlete to represent Bermuda at a para Pan Am game. Uh, again, the medal this year, you won the first medal at the World Championship, first track and field athlete at a Paralympic level. Yeah. Does it ever floor you how much you've achieved in a short amount of time? Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, like when I look back on it, I think it's, it's pretty incredible, and it, it definitely motivates me more to see how much further I can go. Have you seen an increase of interest in para sports, not even from the community watching, but even from individuals wanting to participate? Um, I definitely think it's starting to grow. Um, I do think that um, there is a lot more improvement that can be made. Um, I think it's just bringing more awareness and um, more awareness of the different kinds of sports and the different kinds of levels. Um, that there is that you can compete at. Like you can just do it recreationally. It doesn't have to be something that takes you all around the world or to different competitions. I was on your blog. You seem to repeat being yourself and self-acceptance. Yeah. When did you get to, or maybe you've always had um, a feeling of self-acceptance? Um, I definitely didn't. Um, when I was younger, um, when I was a kid, I, I never wanted to have my disability and I didn't want anybody to ask about it and I didn't want to have it. Um, but I kind of got over that because I realized that this was the life I was given, and I could either let it defeat me and consume me, or I could conquer it. And my grandmother was a huge influence on that, because that was always her saying. Um, so I think just my family supporting me and, and showing me that there are things that you can do and, and not holding me back definitely helped as well. And what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions about parasports or disabilities in general? Um, I definitely think that one of the things is um, that I've had a lot of people um, not realize how much training goes into it and they think oh the, the girl in the chair is just getting in the chair they're just giving her something to do um, but I mean we're hitting speeds that are crazy like my best speed is um, actually last week a 36.1k um, on the roller wow. and then my best on track is 30 something um, and I mean the guys are hitting anywhere up to like 45 46k an hour so I mean it, it takes a lot and, and I don't think they realize how serious it is and how much you actually have to train, yeah. Have you seen any change within the community in terms of how people speak to you or treat you um, now that you are an athlete? Um, definitely, yeah, like, um, it takes a long time sometimes to go into town because a lot of people are like, oh, hey, it's you, and I'm like, yeah. Um, so, but it, it's, it's pretty great to see that um, just because I want to bring awareness about disability and, and that you can do things. What are your aspirations following school? Uh, I definitely want to come back to Bermuda. I don't like the winter in Canada. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> um, so definitely to come back to Bermuda, and, and I really want to work at Windreach is, is my main goal, just because they've given me so much in, in my life, and I, I want to give back 
and I want to get back to Bermuda. And that wraps up the list for the most fascinating people of Bermuda 2015. Please feel free to send your suggestions for 2016 to burmebios at gmail.com. I'm Lisa Pickering, and thanks for watching. This program has been brought to you by Cell One, Parleyville Pharmacy, Butterfield and Vallis, and the Friesenbrook Meyer Group. Clothing and accessories provided by Artillery Boutique. With Cell One, you simply get more. More 4G speed and reliability across the island. More warranty coverage from the only carrier authorized to resell Apple iPhones in Bermuda. More first-class service with our 24-7 customer care, whether you're in-store, on the phone, or online. More services, mobile phones, long distance, and home internet, all with one company. Get more with one. Sell one.